and worship you this morning. And we are so humbled by your grace and by your mercy That's right. and by your love that was demonstrated to us on the cross. That's right. It is so incredible that you would call us sinners to yourself. Right. You're perfect. You lived a perfect life and you call us who are so far from perfect to yourself and we are so grateful. Our call of worship this morning is again from Psalm 62, which we read last week. And I wanted to repeat a little bit of what Pastor Cole told us before he got up to teach last week about this psalm and psalms in general. Psalms are messianic. That means that the psalms are written about Jesus. And we know that because of what Jesus himself said. That everything that was written about him in the Torah, in the law, in the prophets, and in the writings, which is what Psalms is a part of, had to be fulfilled. So the Psalms are about Jesus. And I wanted us to see that again as we read from Psalm 62. Jesus is praying to his Father, who resides in a mountain, on a mountain, on a high rocky summit, in an elevated place. And that's always the place in the Old Testament. And then it gets repeated in the New. Where God is seen to dwell. And where people ascend to meet. And get their strength from Him. And so that's what we're going to see in this song. But I also want to highlight the aspect of Jesus' prayer that is a plea for justice. And I think to varying degrees, we have all longed for justice from God. Can you think about a time when you were longing and pleading for justice and what that feels like to wait for justice to come? Or maybe justice never did come. And we're left wondering what is going on. God is a just God. When is that coming? When are we going to see it? When are we going to experience it? And so as we're reading this psalm, a prayer of Jesus, we ourselves understand to varying degrees what it's like to wait for that. But where does Jesus go? We're going to follow his example. He goes to his Father who resides in the mountains. And why we're going to trust what Jesus said besides the fact that he is the Son of God. We're going to trust that Jesus is going to the right place because Jesus was vindicated by the Father. And we, like our brother Jesus, are coming to our Father, pleading for justice, and are assured of waiting for Him because we saw that happen for Jesus. So what I'm saying is Jesus pled for justice before His Father, and God the Father granted that to Him, that's why we know when we're praying like our brother Jesus that we will eventually see the justice of God. And maybe that's maybe that's going to be in the new heaven and the new earth, but it's coming. It is coming. And we can find our hope and solace in that while we wait. Okay, so let's read this together. Psalm 62 for the music direct, director a song of David call to worship the God of justice God is the only one in whom I find rest and patient wait my rescue comes from him he alone is my mountain my high rocky summit and deliverer he is my elevated place to go I will not be annihilated How long will you all shout that man? All of you are murderers, as dangerous as a bent wall, and tottering broken fence. You spend your time planning how to bring him down from his lofty place. You delight in lies. You talk a good line, pronouncing blessings with your mouths, but inwardly you want to demise and still leave the curse. See you. 
think about this for a moment. Verses five and six, I'll read. My soul will be silent and wait for God alone. Everything I hope for comes from him. He alone is my mountain, my high rocky summit and deliverer. He is my elevated place to go. I will not be annihilated. Congregation. My salvation and glory are in God, the high rocky summit of my strength. My shelter is in God. So all you people, trust in him at all times. Pour out your hearts before him. God is ready. reflecting on the fact that we know that God is a refuge and a safe place to be. Right, verse 9. The sons of mankind are nothing but a mere breath. Exalted people like rulers and celebrities, only an illusion. Put them all together on the scales and they weigh less than a breath. Congregation. Do not put confidence in what you gain by Everyone, God declared this principle once. I have heard it twice. Strength belongs to God, and you demonstrate loyal love, sovereign master, because you repay a person for what he or she does. We're going to keep worshiping. For a minute, we prayed already, Lord. You as the Son of David, the Son of Man, the Son of God, the High Priest of our faith, faithful Savior, exalted Lord, King of glory, hear us this morning as we prepare to surrender to the silver scepter of your word. Incline our hearts to listen to your voice, knowing that we don't deserve your forgiveness, your love, but you have displayed patience with each one of us. You've extended mercy to us. Thank God you weren't just with us. And you've poured overflowing grace in each one of us, turning our unbelief into trust and our anger into love. So we are debtors, debtors to grace, debtors to mercy. Forgive us for believing that we are entitled to you, to redemption, to salvation. Forgive us for being ungrateful and thankful to you. Everything we enjoy today came from you, even the smell of freshly baked bread as a gift that you have given to us. And if there's a Saul of Tarsus here this morning, angry, resentful, rebellious, unsafe to be around, insecure, Lord, treat that person with mercy today. Others have failed, like Saul, have injured other people in the body of Christ. They're obnoxious, arrogant. Have mercy on them. Withhold justice from them that they may be able to wake up and say, who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? We are your people, Lord. We need you. We need a refreshing fountain in our face, in our souls. We are hungry for you. Worship team, Lord, has focused our eyes on you. We have feasted on you. Now fill us again so that when we leave here, we're ready to meet the people that you bring into our pathway. For Jesus' sake, I said, amen. If you grew up and read the newspaper, Charlie Brown was a comic, uh, a comic strip character with Peanuts the dog, no, Snoopy the dog, Linus, and Pigpen, I think. But the Charlie Brown, which means the most to me, is not the cartoon. I never read the cartoons. In fact, I really didn't read the paper. I delivered the paper, but I never bothered to read what was in the newspaper. Charlie Brown, that means the most to me, is a Charlie Brown that was introduced to me by Adam Mackles, a recent author. He's an unusual American writer with a Greek name who has taken stories from reality, especially from wartime, and shown how enemies became friends. I like that kind of story. Do you? Charlie was on his first bombing mission five days before Christmas in December of 1944. He and his crew of 10 others dropped a bomb load over Germany and on the way home he was pounced by fighters 
and his plane was virtually destroyed. Tail gunner was killed. His blood frozen on his guns. Half the crew was wounded. His plane was just torn to shreds. He was barely limping home. And as he flew over an airfield on the way back to England, a German fighter pilot named Frank Stigler saw him fly over. Frank jumped into his Merschersmith, took off, and was aiming to shoot that bomber down. After all, he had just bombed his own city and killed fellow Germans. And when Frank approached the bomber, he could see it was basically a flying junkyard, barely staying afloat. He could see the dead gunner in the tail. Frank could have pulled the trigger with one shot, one array of bullets, and brought everybody down and killed the entire crew, including Charlie Brown. Spencer, his co-pilot, looked over and saw the German pilot next to him and realized, we're dead. We're goners. We've just bombed a German city. And here's this German pilot. He has us dead to rights. And yet, for some reason, Charlie Brown landed in southern England at his airport with his crew intact. And everybody recovered except the tail gunner. How do we explain that? How do you explain the fact that you're in the body of Christ today? How do you explain that you are in the family of God with your sins forgiven, Jesus is your Savior, and you are headed with hope of eternal life? How do you explain that? What reason will you give? How do we explain that Paul, a persecutor of the church, injurious and arrogant, mean, damaging person, how do we explain that he got himself, or that he found himself, in Christian service, serving Christ as the great apostle, author of ten epistles at least, the great apostle to the Gentiles. How do we explain that? This morning's task, text is Paul's personal explanation of why he is in the body of Christ and why he is a servant of Christ. The context for this, of course, as we've seen in 1 Timothy, is that in Ephesus, where Timothy was residing and in some sort of leadership in the church, was being basically facing a problem he didn't want to face and he wanted to leave town. Paul told him twice to stay. And to tell these Christian celebrities in the church to stop what they're doing, to stop teaching, quote, other doctrine. And they wanted to be, Paul says, teachers of the law. They wanted to be celebrities, like in Jesus' day, the teachers of the law. These people of power and prestige, these people who stood on the stage with a mask, hiding death and poison in their personal and private lives. Paul says these people are misusing the Bible to spew out their own message to gain a big following. That says the law of God, verses 8 through 11 of chapter 1, the law of God has a purpose, but it's not made for Christians. The law of God is made for unbelievers to show them their need of Christ, to show them that they come up short and they need someone to intervene and provide forgiveness. So Paul says they're misusing the law. This is the way the law is supposed to be used. Then he starts in verse 12 to answer this question. Since I'm the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle to the Gentiles, how do I explain that I got here? Well, it's not the law. The law didn't bring me to service in Christ. And so he's going to answer the question, how do we explain Paul in the service of Christ? And the answer, as he gives us in verses 12 to 15, is the only explanation for Paul's position in serving Christ is that Jesus did something. He withheld judgment and punishment from Paul who deserved it. He showed him mercy and he gave him grace. Let me read about that in verse 12. I am grateful, or I have gratitude, because Christ Jesus empowered me. Christ Jesus, our Lord, empowered me because he considered me faithful, <clears throat> appointing me to service or to ministry. Even though in my former life, verse 13, follow along, in my former life, the way I used to live, 
Here's three felonious criminal offenses against him. Number one, your Bible says that he was a blasphemer. That's the word for slander. Slander is speaking of people, and probably what he meant here is that he was speaking injuriously of Jesus. Making derogatory statements about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a blasphemer. He was a slanderer. Secondly, he was a persecutor. What does that mean? It means he pursued believers and injured them, men and women, dragging them by the hair to prison. And thirdly, he was a hubristain. He was an insolent, arrogant, aggressive, injurious, is the idea, man. <clears throat> but, don't you like the buts in the Bible? But, he showed me mercy. He showed me mercy because I was doing these things, I was acting these things, I was practicing these things, that is, my arrogance and my persecution and my slandering. I was doing these things in unbelief. I didn't believe in Jesus. Unbelief was the problem. And His grace, He used the word mercy, I'll talk about that in just a minute, and His grace overflowed grace of our Lord overflowed, bringing faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Paul's explaining to us, and to Timothy, and to his readers, that the only reason he's serving Christ is what? How does he explain it? What does he point to as the reason? Did he say, well, one day I saw Jesus Christ and I believed in him? He didn't say that. He mentions faith. But it's only faith that came as God gave him grace and gave him love. How does he explain it? He only explains his position as a servant of Christ, diakonos. He says God showed him mercy. Now let's talk about that for a minute. How much does mercy play a role in our lives? What is mercy? We hear those terms all the time, don't we? Mercy, grace. We kind of use them as Christianese. What is mercy? Well, I've been in court many, many times for people in jail and prison. So I'm well acquainted with what mercy is. There's a very few number of times I've heard a defendant standing before a magistrate saying, I plead for the mercy of the court. What's he saying? Or her. What's he saying? The person who says, have mercy on me, is admitting guilt and admitting they deserve to be punished and to be given a long sentence. And so they're not saying, I'm entitled to forgiveness. I'm entitled to a lower sentence. I'm entitled for you to reduce my sentence and let me walk free. They're not saying that. They deserve punishment. But when you extend mercy to somebody, you're saying, okay, I'm not going to punish you. You deserve to be punished to the fullest extent of divine justice. But I'm going to show you mercy. I'm going to withhold punishment. That's what happened to Paul. Paul is so honest about where he is. He's a man of integrity. He takes his sins seriously. He doesn't whitewash them and says, the only reason I'm a servant of Christ, what? It's because God showed me mercy. What does this do? to the celebrities in the Ephesian church who want to be teachers of the law and are abusing the Bible and misusing it. What does it do to them? What does it do to Christian people who do not stick to God's redemptive program, which Paul is explaining here? What does it do to people who misuse the Bible on television, Christian television, and get on the stage and make all these remarkable things, say all these remarkable things about some teaching and they're taking verses out of context. What, is it, what does it say? <laughs> well, when you compare what they do to what Paul does, saying the only reason I'm here is because God showed me mercy. I'm a criminal. I had three felony counts against me. I deserve divine justice. And the only reason I open my mouth and can share the gospel is what? God had mercy on me. You know, you can't brag about that, can you? You can't brag about that. 
How do I explain that you're in the church? How do you explain that you're a part of the body of Christ? God showed me mercy. That means that all of us realize that entitlement is such a four-letter word. None of us are entitled to forgiveness or eternal life. None of us are entitled to a place in the body of Christ. The only explanation I have for being where I am this morning is God showed me mercy. <clears throat> a couple of other things that come to my mind as I look here. Paul says, uh, he considered me faithful. While Paul was still a savage beast in Judaism, at least he was a faithful savage beast. And Jesus looked at this criminal and said, I could use him in my body. He can take that faithfulness and he can use it for the gospel. But Paul is making sure that that's not what saved him. He's just making sure that Jesus, who knows us and knows our strengths and weaknesses, even in people who are against the church, that now that man could be a benefit to the body of Christ. And so he withheld punishment and then gave him grace. Grace, see, is the opposite of mercy. Grace is giving us what we don't deserve, love, faith. Mercy is withholding what we do deserve. And Paul experienced both. And that's his only explanation for being a servant of Christ. Then he gives us what is called a slogan. And he uses the same word that he used to describe himself because he considered me faithful. Verse 15. <clears throat> this saying or this word is faithful and everyone ought to accept it. It's worthy of acceptance. Here it is, that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners and I am, not I was, I am today, still, as a servant of Christ, I am, what? The protos. I am the protos. What does that mean? means I'm first in line. I'm first in line as a sinner. And Paul is, to me, giving a death knell to all Christian celebrities. He really is, isn't he? He says, I take no credit. I take no credit for anything in my life. The only reason I'm here is that God showed me mercy. And I'm just a classic example of a sinner who found grace. That's our story, isn't it? Isn't that your story? Mm -hmm. You're not saved because you believed. We all must believe. But the faith that you have is a gift that God gave you. Prior to that, he showed you mercy and withheld punishment. Without that mercy, you never would have believed. So how do I explain that I'm up here this morning? The only explanation is the mercy of God. Now what grounds do I have to brag about anything? <laughs> what grounds do I have to promote myself on a stage somewhere? What grounds do I have? By doing that, what am I doing? I'm stealing from the honor and the glory of Jesus. I'm a thief. And that's what Christian celebrities are. They are thieves who are stealing the honor and glory of God by self-promotion and putting themselves forward, making themselves look good. The second thing Paul wants to tell us here is that, <clears throat> and the first, the first explanation is a short-term thing. Paul is saying, mercy is the only reason I'm here. The second reason in verses 16 and 17 is a long-term solution down through the pages of history. But, verse 16, but, here's another huge but. In fact, it's the biggest but in the Bible. Sorry, I don't mean, to mean anything dumb by that. But there's certain buts in the Bible. Some are really minor. And this is a major one. This is a huge but. It's a huge contrast. But, for this reason, or this is why, I was shown mercy. He's repeating the word from verse 13. 
but he showed mercy to me. Here is why I was shown mercy. In order that in me, the first, the worst sinner, the first in line sinner, Christ Jesus might show or demonstrate or put spotlights on, what? His overflowing, his incredible, his utmost makra thumia, his long suffering so that I would be a sample of those who were about to believe in him for eternal life. first was short term, the second is long term. Paul says, I'm here because of the mercy of God. But Jesus showed me mercy, picking up from that first point, I'm here because of mercy. The second point is that down through the ages, there are going to be thousands and thousands of people who are just like me. Bad people, wicked people, evil people. There's going to be souls all through church history. And they're going to wonder what? What are they going to start wondering? Can God save me? Can God save a terrible person like me? And all they got to do is study Paul's life, and what are they going to realize? Yep, Paul is a hupotukosin. I'm going to use the word sample. Paul is a sample of those who could be saved. Let me explain what I mean by that. The other day, I went to Paolo's for a lunch, as I've been doing for 30 years and more. <clears throat> and I walked up to the counter. I was about to order, and Dave came over, and he handed me a piece of eggplant. How many of you like eggplant? Congratulations. Your mother raised you right. And if you didn't, I need to have a talk with you. He handed me a piece of eggplant that was ready to eat. And I just ate it right there. Was he, what was he giving me? A sample of a large pot of eggplant. Now, Paul is a sample. Paul is an eggplant. He's just a piece of eggplant. Paul is saying, don't look at me. Don't put the spotlight on me. I'm not the hero in this story. Who's the, star, who's the hero in the story? Who's the good guy in the story? The one who made the eggplant, right? Not the eggplant, Pete's. <laughs> We're not going to shine our lights on that piece of eggplant and clap. We're going to say, who made this? And I think it was Mark who made it. And so all the kudos go who? to the cook. Paul says, I'm just a sample. Don't put your lights on me. Don't put me on a platform with your smoke and your silly lights. I'm not the hero. Who's the hero? Jesus. I'm just a sample of his what? His patience. You know, that's not a very high piece, is it? That's not a very high position in life. Is I am a sample of Jesus' patience. Wow, that's pretty low. In fact, in Ephesians and Corinthians, Paul says, I'm the least of the saints, and I'm the least of the apostles. And now he says, I'm the worst sinner. And it's like, wow, Paul, we expected you to be up here, but you're at the bottom. You put yourself at the bottom. Now just stop for a minute. Think of this. How many epistles, how many epistles bear Paul's name in this New Testament? At least ten. Right? He was equal to the Apostle Peter. In fact, he, he did more miracles than the Apostle Peter, right? And when Luke looked for a, a life that could emulate Jesus' life and the Gospel of Luke, who does he choose? He chooses the life of Paul as a parallel to the life of Jesus. If Jesus raises the dead, Paul raised the dead. If Jesus conferred the Holy Spirit on people, Paul conferred the Holy Spirit on people. If Jesus healed a man lame from his mother's womb, what did Paul do? He healed a man who was lame from his mother's womb. Paul had scars. He was uh, whipped, 
beaten, left for dead, stoned, not because of drinking, but stoned with rocks. He was, he left, he was in the open sea for a day and night. He had scars all over his body. In fact, his, his vision probably uh, was permanently impaired due to being stoned, and he writes about that in Galatians. So here we have a guy named Saul of Tarsus, who by grace has become the great apostle to the Gentiles. And what does he do? If anybody had a right to be a celebrity, who would it be? I mean, if there's, I mean, he was the most Christian, I think he's the most Christian man who ever lived. He's the most Christ-like character that has ever lived. He is the most valuable player of the entire New Testament, save Jesus. And what does he say? I'm the worst sinner, I'm the least of the saints, and I'm the lowest of the apostles. What's Paul trying to do? Do you see what Paul's trying to do? He's saying, guys, I'm not a celebrity. I'm a criminal who was mercied, and that's the only reason I'm here today. He's humble and he's honest about his sins. And he, he lets us know the way he really is. And who's left standing? Who's left standing in the story with lights on? Jesus Christ and mercy. It's the death knell to every Christian celebrity. It's the death knell to anybody who pushes himself forward and portrays himself as a great person. It's such a tragedy because it's so anti-Christ, anti-gospel, and anti-God's redemptive program. It says nothing good about the Savior, but it's the prominent position of the church today. To me, it is a travesty of justice. It's the way it is. It's the way it is. <clears throat> Look what happens in verse 17. What does he do? What does he do in verse 17? It's a burst of what? Applause. For who? Himself? All right, folks, give me a hand. I've got great talents. I've got a great voice. I've got a great speaking ability. Give me a hand. No, what does he say? Now to the king, eternal, immortal, that is, he never dies, invisible, you can't see him, the only God, be what? Be honor and glory to the end of ages, or to the age of ages. And then he asks for us to say, yes, right on. Amen. Don't you like Paul? He had every reason to consider himself great, except that he remembered the truth. <laughs> He's nothing more than a criminal who deserved to be condemned and punished. And he said, but you know what? Jesus looked at me and just had mercy on me. Praise his name. You never get the idea when you listen to Paul speak or when he writes his epistles that he's great. In fact, do you know why the, the Corinthians put him on trial? Do you know why the Corinthian church put Paul on trial in their mind? That he wasn't a real apostle? And he was inferior to the twelve? You know what the reason was? He was not a trained speaker. He was a poor speaker. He was boring. He couldn't hold an audience and sway an audience and keep people's interests up. The Corinthians accused him of being a poor speaker and he said, you're right. What does that show about that church? What does that reflect about the values of the Corinthian church? By the way, which is the worst church in the New Testament. What does that say about them? What do they value? Talent over character. Talent over heart. The ability to do something really well versus godliness and Christlikeness. That's the American church. They value talent at the cost of valuing Character. Let me share then some things that come to my mind that we might consider for our own families. Takeaways. <clears throat> the first one is to continue to um, take a sledgehammer and uh, try to smash the attitude that we all struggle with, and that's entitlement. 
Let me make this comparison. The church is not a country club. What happens in a country club? Now, I've never been a member of a country club, but I've done a lot of weddings at country clubs, and so I've met a lot of people who are members. What happens in a country club? You pay your dues, and I imagine it's probably more than $10 a year, and what are you entitled to do at the country club? What are you entitled to do at the country club? If they have a pool, you can swim in. If they have a cafeteria, you get to eat in. If they have a golf course, you get to play golf. If they have concert rooms, you get to use those rooms, right? And if someone says, what are you doing here in this uh, country club? You say, well, I what? I paid my dues. I'm entitled. How's that different from the church? How do you explain, how do I explain that I'm in the church? Did I pay my dues? Who paid the dues here, guys? Who paid the dues? Jesus. So why is it that you're here? Tell me again. Why are we here in church? Why are we members?